for uh, joining us for the last seminar of the series this uh, academic year. Um, we are very, very pleased to have Michael Parker here, um, especially because this is the second attempt to have the seminar. Um, initially, it was scheduled for March, and then we had a snowstorm, and we had to cancel it. So, um, the weather has only minimally improved, but at least, at least uh, we, uh, we are able to have the seminar today. Uh, just to briefly introduce Michael Parker, I think many of you will know uh, a lot about him already. But for those uh, who don't, um, Michael Parker is a professor of bioethics at the Fox Centre at the University of Oxford. And his main research interest is um, the ethics of collaborative global health research, which I found uh, quite an interesting um, sort of approach, um, sort of the ethics of really collaboration in, in, in research. And as part of that, come in, come in. Um, Michael coordinates the Global Health Bioethics Network, which um, the uh, the Global Health Bioethics Network um, carries out research, ethics research, and also builds uh, builds um, ethics capacity across the Wellcome Trust major overseas program. And this program essentially is a set of research projects in a range of low-income countries um, into um, diseases with uh, particularly high morbidity and mortality. And so um, um, this uh, Global Health uh, Bioethics Network works, works with the Wellcome Trust uh, program. And in addition to that, Mike also leads the um, um, ethics program of the malaria uh, genomic uh, epidemiology network, which again uh, carries out research in a variety of low income countries. Um, I think without much further ado, I hand over to you, Mike. Thanks again for coming. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for asking me to be here. Yeah, really nice, nice to be back in Brighton. It's nice to see so many people that I, that I know. It's a new place. Um, so when I was asked to come and give the talk, I was asked to talk about this, the work that you've just described, the global health ethics work that we do at Ethox with our partners. And so that's what I'm going to do. And I, but I think there are sort of a, a number of ways into this. So one of them is hopefully to illustrate something about the kinds of ethical issues that arise in this kind of international research. So hopefully it will display some of that and say something about some of the difficulties, methodological and theoretical, of getting to grips with those, trying to understand those. That's one thing. I think the other thing which potentially may be interesting to anthropologists, social, social scientists, and certainly is interesting to me, is that this is an example of, I think, something which is an emerging and interesting phenomenon, which is the ways in which ethics is increasingly being built into and becoming part of scientific collaborations. And so I think this is a particularly kind of distributed and... I, I guess reasonably and well funded example of that. So hopefully that's, you know, I'm not going to say anything very analytic about that, but that may be something you might want to, to talk about. And I guess the third thing is potentially it illustrates some of the issues, the ethical issues that arise in research collaboration as opposed to the more traditional ethical issues which tend to get talked about in international research, such as those that arise, tend to arise in bilateral relationships where researchers from rich countries are going and doing research in poor countries, and that generates issues about community engagement or consent, those kind of things. This, I think, also illustrates some other kinds of and interesting ethical issues to do with collaborations between different scientific groups. How, how, are, how is access to samples managed? Who, get, who sets the ethical, the scientific agenda? Those kinds of issues which I think are particularly interesting. But the way I'm going to do this is just as a, essentially a straight description of the work that we're doing. But I've got those three things kind of weaving through it, and I think hopefully we can have a conversation about those afterwards. Um, so I'll come back and explain this photograph at the end to say something about that. But that's a photograph that it's two photographs taken at the same time in Maysot in on the Thai Burma border. Okay, so just a bit of background, perhaps to say something about the Steve Doc Centre where I work. It's important to for me to say that. The centre, which is based in the Department of Public Health in Oxford, does more than work on global health ethics. It works essentially in three areas. So one area is to do with clinical ethics, so ethical issues arising in the day-to-day -day care of patients, the running of healthcare systems, the making of health policy. Um, that's one, one stream of work. Another stream of work is research ethics, and that is both in the UK and internationally, uh, research in cancer genetics, for example. And then the third area is global health ethics. And the global health, in some ways, is, takes a bit from the other two, but it's because it's become such an important piece of work for us, we kind of 
give it its own name as a program, but the centre does a whole range of these things, and people work together from different disciplines. We've got anthropologists, sociologists, philosophers, and a range of other lawyers, and a range of people from other disciplines working together across those different um, boundaries. And one of the messages that I think that comes across from this work for me is the importance of capacity building going in both directions in this project. So we very much benefited from this project. This has not been about us going out and benefiting other people. We, we've benefited and you know, that's important to be, be reflective about that to some extent. We've obviously got grants as a result of this work. And so we're, 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 you know, that's, we're, that's how we're positioned in relation to this. I thought I'd start by saying something, having done that, I thought I'd say something about ethics and the way in which I think about ethics and the way in which we've thought about ethics in this particular project. And there are a whole range of ways of getting into this. But this is my starting point for today. When you go and talk to scientists, so when I went, first went and spoke to the malaria scientists that I'll tell you about in a minute, you always have a sense that for them, ethics is about regulation, and it's about rules, it's about ethics committees, and it's about the kinds of things that stop them doing valuable research. So you've probably heard about all of these moves internationally at the moment about um, sensible guidelines, these kinds of moves to, to try to make guidelines more conducive to good quality work. And often those scientists portray that as an ethical problem. You know, it's unethical that all this ethics stuff is stopping us doing our science. And to be honest, sometimes they've got a point about that. Mm -hmm. so, but there's a, so that's always a challenge when those initial conversations. So the starting point is often ethics is about regulation and ethics committees, and it's, it's getting in the way of doing valuable research. And that's particularly important in the context of research that's being done internationally. It wasn't that long ago when we were saying it was unethical that only 10% of the world's medical research was being addressed to the problems faced by 90% of the world's population. They see themselves as doing research in that area and they think, hang on a second, you know, we were responding to an ethical need and now you're telling us we're being unethical. So there's this sort of stuff going on. What I want to do in this and in our work is to suggest a more constructive way of thinking about the relationship between ethics and science. And I want to argue that high quality ethics, appropriately critical and so on, can play an important role in supporting the development of appropriate and successful science. And that's not necessarily, there's not necessarily a contradiction between those two things. And I think just as a way of starting out on that road, I think it's important to pay attention to two different ways in which ethics tends to be done. And this is like, so one is this, this broader point about the idea that ethics is somehow outside of the science, the idea of ethics as regulation. So ethics being manifested in the roles of ethics committees, IRBs, research ethics committees, national, regional, and international guidelines and regulations, and institutional requirements, universities placing requirements on and restrictions on the kinds of things that their researchers can do and funders and so on. So that's what I've put together here as ethical regulation, but it's clearly a complex area. By contrast with that, I want to highlight the importance of what I've called ethical reflection, and this is the engagement of scientists in their day-to-day -day work, health professionals and others, <coughs> with their own sense of the, the, the work that they do has a moral dimension. They struggle with those practical problems in their day-to-day -day work, and together with their partners. And they see this as, a, as an important part of their work. And they would probably be doing that even if there were no regulations and even if there were no ethicists. It's been striking to me the number of times I've spoken to very, uh, you know, very engaged scientists, very committed to their work. One of the things they struggle with most often is Am I doing the right thing? Am I going about this in the right kind of way? And you know, I don't want to overemphasize one or other of these, but I think they're both important, and it's been striking to me that that's been a part of science for scientists. Now, just bearing in mind those, that's a, obviously a, to some extent arbitrary distinction, and we can question it later, but just bearing that in mind, one of the things that's striking, I think, in the, against the background of the emerging new forms of science that we're all aware of, is just how often it is that both the regulation and the ethical reflection lag behind the practical problems at the cutting edge of science. There's a sense in which scientists are struggling with the day-to-day -day practical ethical issues, and the regulation and ethics committees are struggling with those, and they're, they're both, in such, to some extent, lagging behind. Lagging is obviously perhaps not the right word, but struggling at least at that, at that interface. And what I think this suggests is there's a need for a kind of ethics which is more engaged with the day-to-day -day practical problems of scientists, those faced by real-world scientists, and I bring all research actors into that, so field workers, uh, funders, and so on, in, real, in the, in the real-world settings where they're doing their research. And so I think there was a need for more of that kind of ethics work. And I'm not suggesting that should replace other kinds of ethics work. I'm saying that there's, there's a gap that, 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 where that work could go. 
And what I want to argue is that there's a need for ethics research that's in that space, that's systematic, rigorous, that is grounded in the real experiences of scientists and participants and communities, uh, so it's evidence-based, it's close to practice, but it is also critical, appropriately critical, so it has, there's some friction between it and just science getting on with what it, what it does, so you know, it has to have that element too. And I think that this, for me, this suggests the importance of a kind of ethics which is built into scientific collaborations, it has its own specific role in those collaborations. It's not seeing itself as a, as a sort of handmaiden to science, but, but has a genuine role in those collaborations. And that brings with it all sorts of potential problems associated with complicity, um, how, do you, how do you maintain that critical edge. But those are, those are problems that need to be talked about and dealt with. I don't think they're, they're problems that um, are necessarily an impediment to this kind of work being done well. The other thing I think that's important here, to me as an ethicist, as a philosopher by training, is that this suggests the need to bring together rigorous philosophical and ethical analysis with a whole range of social scientific and other empirical disciplines. Because one of the points here is that you need to be able to get a good grip on the, the rich reality, as it were, of the cutting edge of science. We need to be able to get a sense of what that is. And I don't just mean that in a social scientist come in and describe it sense. I mean, it requires an analysis and, re and real th theoretical work. So it's not, you know, all of these are really important contributions to that problem. So that's one way into it. That's kind of my way into it, I suppose. But I think there's another way into it as well. And that's the way in that many of these scientific institutions take. And I think the one way to start with this is to say, to ask, so I was at the Sanger Institute uh, a couple of weeks ago, and so it might be reasonable to, one question you could ask yourself is, what would it be reasonable for a, a world-leading scientific institution like the Sanger Institute in Broad, or funder like the Wellcome Trust, or a medical school like the Brighton Sussex Medical School, what would it be reasonable for them to expect of a researcher who was asked about the moral dimensions of the work they were carrying out, or carried out by that institution? It seems reasonable that they ought to have some sort of awareness that their work has a moral dimension, that they ought to have some ability to identify some of the ethical issues, and they ought to be able to say something about the ways in which their institution is addressing those issues and the kinds of policies that have been developed. And I think this is part of being a world-class, for scientists, this is a part of being a world-class scientific institution to be able to engage with this. So I think, apart from my own view, the view from ethics, as it were, to why this is important, I think from, from a scientific point of view, this is important too. So what I want to do now, against that background, is sort of tell the story of my, my own involvement in this. And Anne was asking me at the beginning how I got involved in Malarigen, and maybe worth telling that story. So Malarigen is the Malaria Genomic Epidemiology Network. It's a project which brings together 30, more than 30 partners in 25 countries. Uh, about 15 or 16 of those are in malaria endemic areas across, um, mainly across Africa and Southeast Asia, but a range of other places too. And the way I got involved in this is I, for many years, I've been running a, essentially a discussion group for clinical geneticists in the UK. So I set some of this up in, in the late 1990s, and it's a forum where anyone working in clinical genetics, laboratory staff, uh, nurses, counsellors, doctors, can come along and they can present an ethical case that they're struggling with, and the rest of the group, their, their, their colleagues essentially argue through and decide what they think the right thing to do would be. And the idea is to develop a model of good practice that across the UK clinical genetics community. And one of the people who came to that on occasion was a paediatrician who, in addition to his work in the UK, has an interest in malaria. And he approached the Gates Foundation about doing, a, doing this project, and they said, well, we'd obviously like you to take seriously the ethical dimensions of what you're doing. And most other Gate Grand Challenges took that to mean, well, we'll do a bit of thinking about the ethics, whereas he took, with Dominic Kriakowski, he took this to mean, let's have a, a substantial ethics program of work as part of this project, so a lot of credit goes to him for this. Um, and so if you see on the, so he, and he knew me and contacted me, and I, without knowing anything at all about malaria or about uh, global health, I essentially, with some people, or some other people, designed a sort of a way of doing this. So you'll see from the website, ethics is given a very prominent role, along with the science, which I think is a um, this is just a picture of, I've got to throw a few pictures in to make it more interesting. So this is a picture of uh, a mother um, being asked for consent for her child to be involved in the malaria, in the malaria gen study in Kenya. The malaria gen has collected more than 100,000 samples from those regions, so it's a very big study doing genomic research on, uh, on malaria. 
So what the, what the ethics program does in Malaria, and still does, so it's still continuing, it started in 2005, I think it was, it does three things essentially. So it provides support and advice around ethical issues. So this is essentially people in the network face some kind of practical problem. Um, and, and I will, and other people will try to get a group of people together to, to engage with that problem, try to work out a way forward, a practical, and hopefully ethical way forward. And sometimes that's around a particular problem, sometimes it's around a policy, developing a policy, let's say on consent or something like that. But just to give you an example of that. Um, and the other interesting thing about these is that often these problems arise after the project's been given ethics approval. So this is not something that ethics can to solve, it's something that scientists are faced with once they've got ethics approval. So the one particular example which has been published was a situation in the Gambia where they wanted to get cord, take blood, cord blood from newborn babies as controls for the study. And the ethics approval was given for that, and these, these, these controls were going to be matched, ethic, ethnically matched, and other, matched in other ways to the cases. The problem arose, well, how do you get consent for that? So one possibility would be to wait till women come in in labor and ask them at that point whether, you, whether they would give their consent for the blood to be taken. Another possibility would be to go out into the community, find all the women who are pregnant, get consent from them just in case they came into the hospital. It's a very big area. The majority of women don't go to the hospital to give birth, so that's you know, going to have its bring, bring its own trouble problems. Or thirdly, you could take the blood and then ask for consent after, after the woman's given birth and um, she's in a position to give consent. The ethics committee had no view on that, but the researchers were struggling with it. What's the right thing? What's the right way to deal with this? So that's just one example of a practical problem that arose. In addition to that, we did a lot of capacity building, so teaching scientists about ethics, doing some training, doing some training in ethics committees, and I'll say more about that a bit later on. And thirdly, in a number of situations, Problems arose out of conversations between us and researchers and, and uh, community representatives, which were, weren't amenable to a quick solution. What they required was a more sustained engagement with the problem over a period of time. And so what happened in that situation was we either got funding from Malarigen to do that work, or otherwise we applied to fund the welcome or whoever it was to get funding for, in the couple of cases, a PhD studentship to get someone to do some work on that. So that's kind of the role that ethics played in, played in that. Um, and as I say, it's still, still going and it's um, flourishing to some extent. And I think the work that we've done in there has been quite influential. And I don't take credit for this myself, the whole range of people, scientists and social scientists and ethicists working together on this. I think it's been quite influential in terms of um, how ethics is increasingly being built into scientific collaborations of this type. And there's some specific examples of that. Um, H3 Africa is one example, which is a big initiative, uh, Human Heredity and Health in Africa, which is about promoting genomic research in Africa by Africans. And there are a number of others which have adopted something like this kind of approach. But it's also been influential in other ways. And one example is in relation to data sharing. So at the time this project was set up, it was funded by Gates, as I said, Gates and Welcome. And it was a very strong view that all data should be made open access almost immediately, like within the Genome Project. And that almost, you know, almost immediately, too, sort of struck us as being something that would need some thinking about. And the, given the number of collaborators and numbers of places around the world, this would be something that would need to be thought through. So we set up a process of thinking about that. We put together, we had a meeting, we put together draft versions of the data access agreement and data access policy. And through a number of iterations, we developed approach, an approach which we call managed open access. So this is essentially still minded towards sharing data, so it's not about stopping data. But people have to apply to get access to the data. They have to sign a data access agreement which says that they won't identify people and they'll pay attention to a range of things. And the data access committee has um, representation on it from the data, the countries where the data sets have come from. And that uh, was published and has, again, been quite influential, I think, on and one, among, among other initiatives, there's been a shift in data, or data access towards more managed approaches, and partly as a result of groups like this doing this kind of work. So it's been reasonably, reasonably influential. And the interesting thing about this was that this was, I think, us doing some reasonably critical work. So the scientists were very, this was very much about data sharing this initiative, and over time they came to be more, sen more sensitized to these kinds of worries. So um, I think the ethics did play a proper role there, and you know, did some work. 
So one of the things that, um, that struck us is important. First of all, there are a range of ethical issues which I, I can say something about later, but many of those are very recognizable issues around consent, community engagement, data sharing, use of samples. Uh, one of the things that happens in this kind of project, of course, is you have to find 100,000 samples. You're not going to go out and collect them from now. You go around and look for partners that have got samples already, and you try to get in, in those. Many of those samples have, were consent was given for many of those samples several years ago. So in some cases, the consent is going to be um, ambiguous in relation to this as a proposed research use. So how do you go about thinking about that? Um, so there's a whole range of issues there. But one of the things that struck us as an ethical and a scientific issue was the need for capacity building. So it was clear that if the scientists were involved, interested in sustained research on malaria in the long term, then we're going to be involved. They were going to need to do some work to build scientific capacity in these partner sites, particularly around the analysis of genomic data. So they set up a bursary scheme to, to train, fund people in a number of those places. But it was also clearly the case that ethic, there was going to be a need to build ethics capacity as well. And it struck me that this was an ethical, an ethical responsibility that we had in addition to those, the other partners. It struck us as being something we needed to take seriously. So what we did with the partners was we put, our first thing we did was put in an application to the Wellcome Trust for an Enhancement Award, which funded three PhD studentships. And we also encouraged other people to put in applications for, for funding. Um, yeah, that's just the end of that. So the, the rest of the talk, in some ways, is just, I think, hopefully it's interesting because it's talking about the, a range of things that people from uh, the settings where the work has been done identified themselves, to, together with us, but identified for themselves as important ethical issues that they wanted to do work on. So these are, this is an example, in a sense, about, of the way in which a project like this can sort of flush out some interesting and new problems. Some of them are new and some of them are less new, but these are the things that people struggle with. So these are the three, the three successful candidates in our, our Enhancement Award. Paul, and they're all just, just about finishing. Paulina's got her Viva next week. So her, her project is on the collection and export of blood samples from Africa, which has become a major issue. Um, and she did work in Kenya and Ghana, looking at attitudes to that. And she, she was a member of a Ghanaian ethics committee who was involved in malaria and, and this struck her as an important issue. Uh, Bin is a, was running clinical trials in Vietnam and got interested in research. In, initially, it started out being about malaria, but then it's what struck her as being really important in Vietnam was the ethical issues that arise when you want to do a research project in the context of a rapidly emerging epidemic. Which might only last, you know, it might last just for a few weeks, and you've, you need to you need to get the research started. And how do you do that? Ganley is again from Ghana, and he's uh, actually an anthropologist by background. He was interested in the fact that in Ghana there's free maternal child healthcare, but people don't access it, don't use it. So he was interested in the equ equity issues around that. And it wasn't it wasn't strictly about research, but he was such an outstanding student, and the outstanding candidate. We just thought we had to go with the best person. And three other people putting grants independently of us and independently of that project to welcome uh, for studentships. Uh, Larumbi in, in Nairobi did a project on understandings of benefit sharing and social value in, in Kenya. Yantina, who's now leads the ethics work in HRE Africa, she's the chair of the ethics committee there, did a project on ethnicity, the way in which genomic research uses ethnicity data um, to deal with population structure problem, it's a scientific problem, but then they've got all this ethnicity data, what do they do with it? Uh, and Vicky Marsh, in, again in Kenya, does work on essentially feedback of incidental findings, sickle cell status findings, and how that, how that gets dealt with. Which is interesting, because also it's an example that people are struggling with in the UK and, and other countries now, <coughs> around genomics, you know, how do you deal with feedback, and she's done a, an empirical project on, on that. And interestingly, raised all sorts of issues about people in rural Kenya asking for paternity tests, which is kind of interesting. Okay, but this, so this is, so that seemed to us at the beginning like a way of getting started with some capacity building, but of course it generates problems. Every, every solution generates new problems. And one of the problems this gel, gel, uh, generated was what you do with all the people who apply for these things, but are just not the right, they're not at the right stage to do the PhD work, but they clearly have an interest, they, with a bit of support, they could certainly have the capacity to do this kind of work, and they're associated with the <coughs> So each of those studentships attracted 
more than 60 full applications, hundreds of people contacted us, but 60 full completed application forms with references. To be completely honest, probably about five or six of them in each case were, were ready to do a PhD. The vast majority were, and there were probably five or six who were never going to do a PhD and probably weren't going to do anything really in relation to ethics. But that left sort of 40 or something in the middle who were, had really interesting ethics, ethical questions, were associated with research centers, so had access, um, had time, uh, and had men mentoring support, local mentoring support. And they, so it seems such a pity, such a shame, and such a pity in some ways that we weren't able to do more to help them. So that struck us, well, what do we, you know, can we do anything else? As, and us being all of the people in the, in the, in malaria tank, really. Um, and so I went and talked to people at the Welcome, and we, we got essentially an agreement which was that they would accept uh, an application for a strategic award, so not going through the usual funding panels, going to the governors of the class, <laughs> if we could get all of the directors of the OC programs to sign up to the project. So that was the task to sort of get these scientists, leading scientists, to say that they will be um, applicants on an, on an ethics project, which is which, which we did. Um, and just to sort of explain who the partners are. So one is six, if you include ourselves. The, the, and that's so these are main, centers mainly funded by Wellcome. They get funding from other places to get other funding sources. <coughs> Oxford University Clinical Research Unit in, in Vietnam, uh, Malawi, Liverpool, Wellcome Unit in Malawi. The, the very interesting overseas program in Thailand, which I'll say a bit more about, which is uh, interesting in a whole range of ways, partly because although it's based in Bangkok, it does its work all over the world. So it does work, it carries out studies in a number of African countries, India, Bangladesh, uh, Cambodia, uh, Burma, and so on. So basically a global network based there. Uh, Kilifi unit on the coast of Kenya, uh, the Africa Center in Kwazulu Natal, and these are all examples of bits of community engagement that they've done, and I'll say not um, so we got this started. The, 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 the network has, and this is where it starts, this is the kind of ethics initiative, I think, which I think is interesting, you know, could be studied in its own right in some ways. As a, so why would Welcome give this money? Why would scientists sign up to be involved in something? This, I mean, there's a, you were talking about politics earlier. You know, it's, it, there's a whole range of interests at stake in this kind of setting. So, but, so the stated aims, the stated three aims of the, of the network are, firstly, to promote and encourage ethical reflection across the network in any, you know, any opportunity where that arises. Secondly, to build the capacity for the ethics, for the OSIS programs to identify and address ethical issues in their own work. And thirdly, because capacity building takes time, to do some research now on the kinds of ethical issues that are arising in the day-to-day -day work of the, the OSIS programs. And obviously these things are all related to each other. Uh, I'll just say something briefly about the, about the three of them, and then I'll just want to say something a bit more about the actual work. So under capacity building, Learning from the scientists, which I guess is another interesting thing, we set up a capacity building bursaries program so we can give grants of up to £10,000 a year to people interested in ethics in each of those five places. Uh, and in practice, we've given more, we've given smaller grants, but more of them. We run an annual summer school um, where people come together from all of those places. We support it and we support applications for funding by ethicists or by scientists who want to build some ethics into their work and we've got some online resources. And we've done things to just promote discussion. Some of that was obviously going to take place in those capacity building meetings, but some of it, so for example, a couple of weeks ago, I ran an ethics clinic in Malawi, and it was completely voluntary, and about 20 scientists came along and talked about their projects, and we discussed what some of the ethical issues might be that they might face, and we, it was a very practical discussion. Um, and ethics research, this is kind of interesting, I think, in many ways, because when we, were, when we were asked to put in the application, when we got agreement to put in the application to the Wellcome Trust, they wanted it, well, of course, it, although it's a strategic award, you can't just go in and say, well, we're going to do stuff that seems relevant and interesting. You have to come up with some specific research questions and aim, but we didn't want them to be too tightly clar you know, delineated. We wanted them to be, to create enough space to do interesting, to say, give a sense of what we're doing, but to create enough space for us to be responsive and flexible. So the four research questions were, what are the responsibilities of researchers into the community, to the communities where they do their work? What are the obligations of researchers in these new forms of collaborations between different research groups, but also hospitals, ministries of health, and so on? 
how can researchers in their very complex international governance complex work out practical solutions? What's the right thing to do? I gave the example of the Gambian blood, uh, blood sampling. And the final one is to do what are the ethical dimensions of community engagement. So not just to do community engagement, what are the ethical issues that community engagement generates? So what I thought I'd do now is go through and just tell you about some of the bursaries that we've given out and the projects again that they that people have, are doing. And these are these are people who've come up with this project themselves, they've got a local mentor and then they get some support from me or from someone else in the EFOC Centre. So this is uh, Twee, who's in Vietnam. One of the things that she was worried about was the fact that in Vietnamese ethics committees were struggling to get a grip on what should go in a consent form, what, what kind of information should be involved, and there was, there was no guidance on that in, at, at the national, national level in Vietnam. So she got chairs of a number of ethics committees, including a national ethics committee, together to work together for, I think it's about £5,000 for a year to develops uh, essentially an information leaflet for ethics committees in Vietnam. Uh, Pei Kiong Chair, who is, she's a, runs the clinical trials from the Bangkok unit, so she's all over the world doing, doing setting up trials. Um, there's this requirement, WHO and other requirements, that where it's not possible to get consent from children, from young people to be involved in research, you should get assent. There's a huge amount of con a, a, a lack of clarity about what assent means and what does that, how do you do that in practice. And one of the ways in which that uncertainty manifests itself is that people have started to set up, create assent forms. So they've got forms of information that children sign, essentially a mini assent, mini consent. And that didn't strike her as being the right way to do this, so she's doing some work on that, particularly in Bangladesh, where she's setting up a study. Maureen is based in Kilifi in Kenya. A bit, the, the unit there has employs about 800 staff, so it's a very big research unit. Many studies funded by NIH, by Wellcome, by Gates, and so on. And it became apparent through community engagement that many of the different projects were adopting a different approaches to giving benefits for people. So some of the projects reimbursed people's bus fares or travel or fed, fed them. Some of the projects said, well, research is mentally altruistic, we're not going to do anything. And some of the researchers, in fact, a fair number of them, took this as an opportunity to, to benefit communities, so they were giving out more money more benefits than they really needed to because they felt the duty to provide additional benefits. And this started to arise as a causing conflict, as you can imagine, in the community. So this Maureen has, is doing, doing some work to develop a unit-wide policy on benefits, which is informed by community views. So she's, that's what she's doing. And these are all on, on small 5,000, 6,000 pound grants. When the trust um, cut back the budget for the project a bit, I was quite worried because I thought we wouldn't be able to do as much in this area in particular. But I've been surprised how much it's been possible to achieve with a very small amount of money. Often it's generated matching money. Uh, this is Kim. He's in the photograph at the beginning. He's a doctor. He's Burmese doctor based in Thailand who is running clinics, malaria clinics, illegally essentially in Burma, crossing the river, and running clinics in shops. Um, and so he's interested in, and, he, and in order to get some community feedback about his the research, he set up community advisory boards up the Thai Burma border, and he's looking at the, the, the practical ethical issues associated with that, people coming, members of the ethics committees travel often in very dangerous terrain, um, and, and, he's, and he's also trying to evaluate the role of these community groups. Uh, just a couple more. This is a project in Cambodia. In Cambodia, and there's a, a lot of healthcare is provided by volunteers from villages. So there's a big village malaria health workers scheme, several thousand village malaria workers. And they use mobile phones to, um, essentially they can provide some treatment, but when there are difficult cases or more serious cases, they can use the mobile phone to report those cases and call in more expert health advice. And so we've given Lisa a grant to uh, it partly funds 25 of those village malaria workers, but it partly also gets them to, they meant to make a, a note of difficult ethical situations that they come across in their work. They essentially send text messages about those. So, you know, they go to a village, they're meant to be um, helping a particular family, and in fact, there are other sick children around, and these children are up, or their parents are asking you to take them to the hospital. You know, how do you divide your time? Do you do the study, or do you help the children? Those kinds of situations. And finally, uh, Roderick who's in Bantar in Malawi, and he is uh, involved in an HIV self-testing scheme. 
members of villages are essentially given these HIV self-testing kits, trained to be counsellors, and th this is being done as part of, of, of a research study. And um, he's interested in the ways in which knowledge about self-testing is, is moves around the community and the kind of ethical issues that generates, particularly for these counsellors. So, you know, someone comes in, gets a positive HIV test, refuses to tell their partner, or, or those kind of practical issues. So, that, so that's, that was the first year's bursaries that we've had. We've got a summer school in um, Bangkok in a few weeks' time, and they're all going to come and present papers or present talks about their projects. So it'll be interesting to see how much they've done. So one thing, and probably the main thing that we do as part of this project, is to fund those bursaries and support them. We have the summer school, and we also have this website, which is essentially a social networking website, which is for this group of people, about 60 members on it, in all of the, from all of the overseas programs, and they discuss practical practical problems that they that they're facing, share guidelines or pieces of information, or talk about the summer school that kind of thing. It's a pretty active group. Some more photographs. It's a picture of a visit. We went, we went to visit a duck farmer in Vietnam. He was interested in um, interested in the ethics of pan research on pandemic flu. Had been who I talked about earlier. Uh, Organised for us to go and see this duck farm. And this is a really interesting radio listening club in Malawi. So they give this group of people they give people small transistor radios. They listen to a health program on TV and get them discussing the, the implications of the health program. Uh, and what we're trying to do is to get them to have a program about ethics and they'll, this group can talk about ethical issues in their work. This is a picture of the time. Um, okay, I think I've just got a couple of more slides. I think Fintelac falls past, is that yeah. right? Okay. Um, as I said at the beginning, it's very important, I think it's very important for me anyway, but it's also, I think, important in the project that um, despite the fact that we're all here and we're just in global health, there is a need, I think, to build capacity in thinking about global health ethics in the UK. Um, and there's a, need, there's a need for more work. And so we, we do see this project as about building capacity here as well as building capacity in these other countries. And we see it very much in that regard as an, as an equal partnership between the six partners. Um, and so these are, these are the people who are in EFOC Centre who are doing work in this area. They're not all funded by the grant, but they're all working on it in one way or another. Um, Salah Sariola, who may, some of you might know, is an anthropologist from Durham. Uh, Patricia Kiburi is at the London School of Hygiene before, so Salah's Sal doing work on community engagement. Patricia's doing work on research with children, particularly with orphans, children in uh, kind of unusual family situations. Um, Dorcas is um, she's employed by us, but she works half and half in Kenya and in Oxford, and she's trying to generate reflection about community engagement and the ethical aspects of community engagement across those sites. Uh, Dina coordinates the whole thing um, and is particularly interested in human rights. And Susie uh, is interested in online, developing online research, research ethics resources, training resources. She actually lives in Auckland in New Zealand but works two days with And this is just, just, just to say something about the fact that we're also doing research within ethos on these things. And there's, and there's a, I won't say anything more about them now, but just this is a kind of a list of them. But one of the things I'm particularly interested in, as I said, is the sort of ethical issues that arise in research collaboration. Um, over and above the issues about consent, issues related to how people choose to be involved or not be involved in research collaborations, who gets to set the scientific agenda, uh, trust in those kind of relationships, uh, the sharing of samples and money. And I'm also interested in this idea, to some extent drawing on the Richard, Richard Senate stuff about craftsmanship, but also just thinking in a very practical way. The idea, what does it mean to be a global health researcher situated in a network of this kind? What does it mean to practice well, to do good good science in the moral sense of the word? And moral classing isn't the kind of term I'm going to use in, in the end, but it's, it's sort of a placeholder for that kind of thing. So it's sort of just to think, really, to, to, to bring things together for myself. I think that what this shows, to some extent, is that thinking carefully about ethics can play an important role in science. I guess the evidence here is that the scientists signed up to this and seem to think it's important. I don't think it's necessarily always been easy for them, so that I think, which I think is a good thing. I think it's really important this research has an empirical di dimension, despite the fact that I'm a philosopher by background, that's my strong view. I think capacity building in ethics is important, but I think also capacity building has a strong ethical, uh, a strong ethical imperative to build capacity 
in a, in a, in a way that is, a, is appropriate and mutual. I think scientists, the more I've done this, the more I've spent a lot of time with very, very world-leading scientists in an area over the last few years. And one thing that struck me about, certainly about the very best scientists, is just how aware they are and how much they worry about the ethical dimensions of their work and see this as a real struggle for them. And they're often way ahead of me, so we'll have a meeting about some ethical, some aspect of work, and they will have thought before I have about what the ethical dimensions of their work are. At least they'll be able to name them um, and will have worried about them. And I think there's a sort of analogy potentially here to be drawn between uh, this and the sort of thing that Rainer Rapp said, for example, about women and amniocentesis, and the idea that women, who the first women to go through it, were moral pioneers. I think there's a sense in a way in which some of these scientists might, you know, well, obviously it's a, there's a whole range of different how it dynamics, etc. But there's a sense in which they are living at the forefront in, and in ways which can be usefully captured potentially, whilst not simply just taking their word for it. I think that it's important in this kind of research to build in flexibility and to focus on quality. I think it's very hard to convince research funders to allow you to do that. And we were very fortunate, but I think it's in this in this era of ref and evaluation and you know aims and objectives, it's nonetheless very important to try to keep a bit of space for flexibility and creativity. And also I only think that this the Global Health Network is one model of which I'm not advocating this for other people. But it's certainly it's one way in which this could be done, um, and this is a just this that's the beginning. Just a final word about this photograph. In some sense, I think this is quite interesting. So this is a meeting that we had in Naysot on the Thai Burma border. This is Kin, who was the Burmese doctor I was talking about earlier, and he wants to do some work on ethical issues of working with migrant communities and working in these shops, and wanted to design a project to do some empirical work around that, and we were trying to you know, struggle with trying to come up with this with this project. And just the look on his face, the fact that he's kind of you know, really struggling to get to grips with this, I think that's in some ways what this is. You know, and obviously I am as well with Ophar, but I think that's what, what this project is really about for me, is just having those kind of encounters. So I'll stop there. Is that all right? No, it's perfect. <laughs> okay. I hope there's lots to talk about. Thank you very much, Michael. That was great. Um, I think we can just make that a very informal Q&A session. Um, Maybe, yeah, just raise your hand. I try to keep some water and then we can.